Good day and welcome to Letters and Politics. I'm Mitch Jezerich. Anna Mae Wong was the first Asian American movie star. Dropping out of high school in Los Angeles, Anna Mae Wong pursued a career in acting as a teenager. Her first starring role was in the 1922 silent film The Toll of the Sea that has been characterized as a variation of Madame Butterfly. Later, she achieved national and international acclaim for such films as The Thief of Baghdad, The Shanghai Express, and The Daughter of the Dragon. Her roles in the first half of the 20th century were always limited to caricatures and stereotypes of Asian women, something she would be criticized for, something that she was also very aware of herself. But critics have also seen her performances as subversive and undercutting stereotypes that she was forced to play. Today, we're going to be in conversation about the life and times of Anna Mae Wong. My guest is Yunta Huang. Yunta Wong is a Guggenheim Fellow and a professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he is the author of the book that we will be in conversation about called Daughter of the Dragon, Anime Wong's Rendezvous with American History. Yunta Wong, it is my very good pleasure to welcome you to this radio program. Well, thank you for having me. Anime Wong was born in 1905 in Los Angeles. Tell, tell me what's important to know about Los Angeles this, this period of time. Well, it's the intersection, um, that particular moment was um, the virulent anti-Chinese sentiment. Uh, we are talking about uh, only three decades earlier, before she was born, right? That was the infamous 1871 uh, Chinese massacre, in which um, 18 Chinese, uh, I mean, white mobs, uh, you know, stormed um, into Chinatown and... Uh, tortured and killed and lynched and burned uh, uh, 18 Chinese. So this is only three decades later, and Amy Wong, uh, Wong was born in her father's laundromat, um, you know, uh, just a few blocks outside of Chinatown. And that location is also sort of important. We can talk about that a little bit you know, later if you want. And the other, you know, <laughs> piece of the puzzle uh, is really rise of uh, film technology and later on Hollywood. So she was born in that particular intersection, uh, you know, uh, of history, historical events. And um, so as the daughter of a so-called Chinese laundry man, uh, she eventually rose to stardom. And this is really the gist of her story. But of course, the second part is that despite her beauty, talent, and the tenacity, I should emphasize, um, her career was really hampered by racism, uh, but also sexism and later on ageism in Hollywood. Anna Mae Wong had deep roots in California. Her, her bo both sets of grandparents had been in California since what the eighteen fifties? I mean, yeah, eighteen fifties. Right. Well, I mean, the gold rush brought uh, Chinese uh, uh, in those early years, uh, but. But when uh, the, when they arrived, of course, you know, they didn't find the El Dorado, the legendary El Dorado, but really it was an ocean of violence and uh, and uh, and uh, racism against them. Yes, she definitely had deep roots uh, in both sides of the family. And so in some ways, you know, as later manifests itself in her career, for instance, um, after she got parts, got a kind of um, her debut uh, in Hollywood, and later on went on to really play a very you know elite role in the, as you mentioned earlier uh, the 1922 Toll of the Sea. Uh, she was cast as the female lead. Now that's something quite extraordinary, right? I mean, no Chinese or no um colored or non Caucasian actor will will even dream of being cast in the lead role. Um, and there's a reason for that. But anyway, um, so even when her career was taking off, uh, she felt disappointed because after the Toll of the Sea, she had difficulty finding big parts. So she eventually uh, left for Europe. And so to answer your question, this kind of, kind of roundabout way of answering your question, you know, uh, I, as you say, I teach at university at UC Santa Barbara. Some, some, sometimes my students complain that I ramble, I go around, but actually I always have a point. Eventually I'll come back to the point. So coming back to your point, her deep roots in America, which is very important to emphasize because the reason she went to Europe was really to, to be recognized as an American. So later on, she had to go to Australia uh, to be recognized as Chinese. So this is how kind of, you know, uh, paradoxical things uh, could get in her career. 
What, what does it mean to go to, I'm, I'm jumping around in the timeline now, and I'll come back to more of the early years, but what does it mean to go to Europe to be recognized as an American? Uh, because she was regarded as Chinese, and the Chinese at the time in the United States, uh, despite the fact she was a U.S. citizen, uh, but they're not treated as citizen. And, and in Hollywood, um, since she was Chinese, and she was living at the time, Chinese were really considered, you know, no Chinese could play Chinese roles, for that matter, or important roles, because as you know, um, yellow face, for instance, this kind of, you know, white actors putting on a heavy makeup to play Asian characters or Native American characters or black characters, blackface, for instance, so was predominant mode of, uh, of <clears throat> artistic performance. And uh, so she had to leave uh, America in order to be recognized uh, as, an, uh, as a star from Hollywood. She, she wouldn't be the only movie star and entertainer uh, non-Caucasian entertainer that would leave to Europe during this period of time. I think of people like Paul Robeson and, and Josephine yeah, Joseph and Baker. Baker. Yeah, Very famous uh, parallels, certainly, yes. Did they know each other? Uh, they did, actually. Uh, uh, anime One was actually a fan of uh, Josephine Baker. You know, She attended uh, some of uh, Baker's performances in Paris and Berlin, definitely. And Talk to me more about Los Angeles. Los Angeles is Chinatown in, in this period of time. This is also, it, it's not so far, is it? Uh, Chinatown to, to Hollywood? Oh, Chinatown to Hollywood. I mean, today, because of traffic, it can take forever. <laughs> but in those years, so no, it's a, it's a simple hop, you know, across the town. And, um, well, this is another facet of Anime One's story. How did she, you know, get into Hollywood, right? Um, when cinema was, I mean, film was rising um, as a technology and as a new culture in some ways, um, that um, imagine any ordinary American girl, you know, growing up in somewhere Midwest uh, would dream of, you know, becoming a, a star on the screen. And so many of them, as you know, um, will buy one way, one way train ticket uh, to come West. And when they step off, uh, Central Station, later Union Station, uh, they always had their dream. Uh, fortunately for Anime Wong, uh, she did not need to hop on train and you know buy any train ticket. Hollywood actually came to her, not her specifically, but to Chinatown, right, her neighborhood. Uh, because as you know, Mitch, um, in those early years, uh, the films mostly used were a still camera. You know, they just set a camera there and they take in all the street scenes and. Um, and uh, Chinatown was a ready-made set because of kind of exotically uh, costumed, you know, um, <clears throat> pedestrians, uh, the curiosity shops, the displays, the restaurants, and, and all that. So Hollywood took advantage of that, and constantly, almost every day, they'll come over uh, to uh, Chinatown to shoot the scenes. And uh, Anime One, growing up um, uh, around Chinatown, uh, she was definitely one of those... Uh, rubber necklace in those years and she got addicted to film and she dropped out of high school eventually yes uh, she was a good student very diligent student uh, trying to make it good and she was also a tennis player um, but uh, when the big role after 1922 this whole the sea uh, the madam butterfly story and um, she was asked to um, to play a part a very important part in uh, Thief of Baghdad, right, uh, starring uh, uh, Douglas Fairbank. And to do that, she really had to drop out of high school because she was literally on the verge of stardom, right? Because the Thief of Baghdad and Douglas Fairbanks was one of the, you know, um, Mary Ford and the Douglas Fairbank, right? You know, this is like the first couple <laughs> of the United States, actually, more important than the president and his wife in those years. And uh, all the fashion magazines will follow their lifestyle and their decoration and everything. So we're see speaking of that kind of star power and orbiting the vicinity of Douglas Fairbanks and Mary um, Pickford. And uh, of course, she will do anything in order to achieve uh, that ultimate stardom. How did her family respond to her getting involved in movies? Well, first of all, we have to talk about Chinese. <laughs> the camera, right? Uh, uh, to Chinese uh, or to her mother particularly, 
um, you know, the camera is uh, what a soul snatching machine, right? And uh, if you study not just Chinese, a lot of when when cameras first invented, people thought you know the 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 lens, the camera can steal your soul, and that's one of the reasons in those early years, portraitry, right? People when when people have their portraits taken, they don't smile, they look very serious, because when you smile, you re- you reveal your soul and you expose yourself, you become vulnerable. So her mother. I, I, I didn't know that. Did I, 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 you're right. I mean, every old photo I ever see of my family or anyone's family, it's a very serious yeah, photo. I never. It's not because those are really serious people that can take a joke, <laughs> because they're actually afraid, right? You know, they snap. I mean, all those new technologies, right? You know, when radio was first invented, when they first tested on um, Brooklyn Yard, and people thought, oh, that must be an angel singing. And all those, you know, the kind of spiritualism in those years was quite trendy, right? So Chinese were not alone in that thinking that way. But for her mother, particularly, which things you asked about her family's reaction to her, you know, activities in Hollywood or her new career, uh, they were in, initially they were adamantly against it uh, because Chinese were always kind of skeptical of um, people who are in the arts, right? Uh, performers on stage and, and all that, and the film acting definitely is part of that. Uh, so her mother at one point said, um, I really wish, and it's nice you make all this money, you know, you have something good going on, but I really wish you don't make so many movies because um, the more often, you know, uh, you have your pictures taken, you will lose a bit of your soul. And uh, it's a warning, but of course, you know, it's she will not mind that. And so she will say, you know, this is the new world, right? You know, uh, I have to live my life my way and we'll see. It may not be a happy life, um, but uh, we will see what happens. And uh, I mean, I get, I, I wonder. I, mean, I couldn't help but think if if Anna Mae Wong's mother lived long enough and looked back at her daughter's life, that she she might have thought that she was right in thinking that Anna Mae Wong would well, die at the age of fifty six. No, Mitch. Uh, unfortunately, her mother. So let's back up a little. Um, when she was disappointed in the first round um, by Hollywood, she went to Europe, right? When she came back, she was really a big star. And she was doing a, a, um, a stage play on the spot. It's actually, uh, it's it's based on a novel in which there was a kind of Al Capone kind of uh, character. And she plays this, uh, you know, mobster's mistress. And she was being... Um, she was taking to curtain calls uh, uh, on Broadway, and it's a big deal for her because her ambition, part of her ambition, was also to be on stage, right? As you know, I mean, the theater was the real art in those early years, and and in if you look at the early days of Hollywood, and a lot of the and Douglas Fairbank and Mary Pickford, they all transitioned from stage, you know, to to movie uh, as a way to make more money, but in deep down, they still believe that. Theater was a was the more serious art, Shakespearean, right? And so, Anime One was um, uh, in New York um, in 1931. Actually, um, her mother unfortunately uh, died in a car accident uh, right in front of their uh, family laundry, and uh, at the age of 42. So, her mother never lived to see the <clears throat> the ultimate glory and the and the you know uh, tragedy as well in some sense. Um, of her daughter's, uh, you know, life and career. Yeah, I guess my point was, if she could have, she she may have thought that her premonition about what having your 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 picture taken would mean, she would feel justified in, in thinking that because Anna Mae Wong did have a difficult so. life, older as she as she she as she got older. Right, I, I would think so. I mean, so when you read like toward the end of my book, or the, the end of her story. It seems like, you know, her late year was kind of, I know we are kind of sort of ahead of ourselves in the, in the story. But to answer your question, yes, if you look at how depressed she was in her late years because of ageism and you know, and all that. But on the other hand, if you look at today, we are talking about her, right? She's on the U.S. quarter, you know, this newly minted <laughs> anime one quarter. You, you found one or, or maybe you, you found one. I haven't found one. Oh, I just didn't find them. <laughs> I yeah, collected them. Yeah. You know, um, because these coins are, have been snapped up by the coin dealers. 
uh, in order to the book signings and uh, and all that I prepared. I had to buy, you know, buy some of them, um, you know, bags of them at a higher price so I can hand out to the readers uh, who come with the book. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I haven't. Then you one. <laughs> this conversation conversation ends pleasantly. Then I would definitely. <laughs> Send you one. I'll, I'll give you my address. Um, t- talk to me about the transit again. The the first film that Anime Wong stars in is The Toll of the Sea. This is still the silent film era, but she would transition into talking movies. What was that transition transition like for her? Well, it was um, I wouldn't say earth shaking, but was vital and important, as you know. Uh, when film transitioned to, you know, from silent to talky, a lot of the silent stars fell by the wayside, right? And uh, the moment they spoke, uh, it dispelled their charm. <laughs> they have carefully curated all these years. The same thing actually happened to Anime Wong. So, so when she went to Germany in 1928, she was offered a five movie contract to lure her away from Hollywood and to you know, she never traveled abroad before. And uh, at the age of 23, uh, it was quite a, 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 an adventure. And But she made it big. And she made films in, German, uh, in Germany, in France. And then um, one of my favorite was the, uh, the Piccadilly, right? uh, the, the swan song of the, the silent era. And she was fantastic. And uh, she was cast, I will argue, in her most kind of provocative and erotic roles of all of her films. Um, part of the reason was that she was away from the restrictions of Hollywood. I'm not trying to suggest, you know, Europe did not have racial problems, far from it. <laughs> when she got to uh, Weimar, Germany, and we're only talking about a few years before the rise of the Nazis, you know, man in brown shirt and uh, jack boots with billy clubs will, will rise in a few years, come out in from the shadow and into the streets. So at any rate, um, after her success in Piccadilly, as I said earlier, her ambition was really to be in serious theater, live theater. And uh, this is Shakespeare's town. Fortunately, she was offered a lead role in a play called The Circle of Chalk. And... Um, the moment she stepped on the stage and started speaking, the audience was still de- definitely charmed by her beauty, her performance. And of those years, you know, British fans, uh, I'm not talking about like Beatles fans, that kind of craze, <laughs> but still she was mobbed by fans and the British uh, young women will, you know, uh, will wear this kind of wong uh, bang, right? The haircut, you know, she has the kind of straight, you know, bang in the front and the straight in the back as well. But also, they also put on makeups, you know, in a kind of ivory makeup to to do this kind of warm complexion. So we're speaking that kind of star power. So by the minute she step on the stage and is starting to speak, you know, she had this, um, that's why being born in California is important because she, she had this California Valley Girl accent. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the British critics, they were appalled. I mean, you know, this Shakespeare's town, you can't do that, right? You need to have this kind of clip, British accent. And then, and as you see, this is also the moment when film made the transition to Taki. And she realized in order to survive, she needed to have a different kind of accent. So she spent a lot of money hiring a coach, a tutor from Oxford University. And eventually, as you see, her transformation. So she left New York um, in 1928 and returned two years later in the depth of Great Depression. So she left America as like a, a, a you know a flapper and a young girl uh, wearing chic clothes. But she returned on the New York dock uh, two years later, uh, wearing um, you know uh, European fashion clothes and sporting an upper-class British accent. And so she's quite, a, um, I would say, talented in terms of transforming herself, uh, uh, turn herself into a different kind of, um, you know, uh, performing different kind of identity and as a required of her art and her career. You mentioned the flapper, the flapper look. This is a look that we see in photos of, of women in, in the 1920s, sort of a style that, that she was one of the first to really push, wasn't she? 
Oh yes, absolutely. I mean, recently, uh, you know, I've there are, there are photos, and uh, even in the nineteen twenties, I think there was one photo uh, before she left America. Actually, uh, her flapper look, and uh, I think there was a clothing store in down in Tennessee, I believe, and there was like anime one mannequin almost, um, you know, wearing a um, uh, cheap coat because in actually in her teenage years, even before she was old enough to be in a film. And she could only satisfy, you know, her desire and her hunger for performance by um, um, acting as a model, working as a model for a clothing shop um, in, in Los Angeles. This is Letters and Politics, and we are in conversation with Yunta Wong. He is a Guggenheim Fellow and Professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and author of the book that we are in conversation about called Daughter of the Dragon, Anna May Wong's Rendezvous with American History. Talk to me about the roles that Anna May Wong would play in her movie career. And oftentimes the roles have been characterized as being, I guess, quote unquote, dragon lady. What, what does that mean? Well, so earlier we talked about Toll the Sea, and now we're talking about dragon lady. So her performance, her roles are often kind of squeezed, I would say, between, kind of bracketed by these two kind of stereotypes. One, you know, Madam, as Madam Butterfly, she portrays a self-sacrificing um, uh, Asian woman who will fall for a, a Caucasian man, and then, of course, the story ends tragically. A very typical Madam Butterfly story, uh, a, a, a kind of trope, uh, a master narrative that really runs through the entirety of this kind of uh, American popular culture, right? Um, oriental imagination. And the Dragon Lady, uh, again, uh, after her ro rise uh, in Europe, she came back uh, to the United States, and so she was able to really get a, um, the lead role in Daughter of the Dragon, and she plays um, Dr. Fu Manchu's daughter. And Dr. Fu Manchu, of course, it's a British imagination of this evil Chinese um, genius uh, who has design on the West, and so she plays her daughter, and uh, Fu Manchu was played by her good friend, Warner Olin, and who, as you know, was very famous for doing yellow face uh, uh, Charlie Chan, as I described in my previous book on Charlie Chan. And um, so the story in that particular film, uh, 1931, uh, that's really kind of vintage, definitive anime one story, as you said, because it cements her legacy as the dragon lady. And people will usually remember her more as a dragon lady than, say, uh, Madame Bla Butterfly. Um, of, as Dr. Fu Manchu's daughter, she, step, she steps up when her father passed away and to carry on the family mantle to take revenge on their enemies. And she transformed herself since earlier we we're talking about her, her own transformation in real life. In this film, uh, she steps up as, and, uh, as the son of Fu Manchu. So she plays this kind of androgynous role. <clears throat> so on the one hand, she will use her feminine charm to lure you know, two men, one Caucasian, one Asian. And on the other hand, she also plots this kind of murders uh, and, uh, and all that. So. Um, to, to, in a nutshell, uh, Dragon Lady, of course, is a threat, a sexually threatening, and powerful, and a cunning um, Asian woman. Right? It's, that's the stereotype. So, caught between these bracketed, you know, bracketed by these stere two stereotypes, and we're talking about the span of her characterization. And uh, so, she had to really do this very delicate dance um, between uh, stereotype and imagination and uh, a convention because yellow face and uh, madam butterfly or dragon lady these are really conventions you know, built by hollywood and accepted by uh most of the audience in those years and so she had to do this dance in between and so given that very limited artistic space i would say um she really managed to i wouldn't say pull it off uh she was challenged uncomfortable sometimes with these roles but in order to make it in hollywood in those years uh, that there's no alternative right and that's one of the reasons she went to europe in the first place and later on she went to china or australia you know for all these reasons because she was desperately seeking um a better kind of climb 
uh, for her own artistic talent. And she got better roles, non-stereotypical roles. I, I don't know if there are non-stereotypical roles, right. in acting, but, <laughs> but but she got she got different kinds of roles in in Europe and in China. Uh, oh, well, thanks. Oh no, in Europe she did. Although Europe had, like I said, had its own problems. Uh, she was still not able to kiss or be kissed by a white man, uh, even in Europe, right? I mean, they were a little bit more tolerant uh, in Europe, but but not by much because uh, some of the screen screenplays, if you read them, you know, they, initially they actually will contain kissing scenes, but when it comes to shooting, they will still cut it off uh, because you know, I guess Europeans are were as sensitive to uh, racial racial miscegenation as Americans, uh, good old Americans were in those years. Yeah, and and so. Go ahead, please. Well, anti-miscegenation laws are, is an important part of, of this story, including here in the United States. These, I mean, I mean, you have racism, obviously, but even these specific laws against different races of people marrying each other um, mm -hmm. also limited the roles that she was able to play on screen. Right. So because of the later on, the Hays Codes really codified these previous practices that already started in Hollywood and accepted, right? don'ts and do nots or never minds and all that and one of the never minds is exactly as you said uh, a, a non-white you know a woman kissing or be kissed by a caucasian man on the screen and of course that doomed her career uh, she will never play could never get a you know a lead part in a rom-com for that matter and the toll of the sea was really the the only exception and do you know why why would she be cast as the female lead in a sort of like a tragic romantic story, right? Well, the reason actually is quite simple, although somewhat cynical, um, is that uh, Toll the Sea, made in 1922, was really the first uh, Technicolor film. And in order to test the effectiveness of color, they needed real, so-called real Chinese actors to be in these characters. And that's actually one of the cynical reasons she was chosen and to test you know, how effectively, because as you know, or as some of the earlier filmmakers, they, were, they, they complained because uh, some of the European lead, you know, uh, leading ladies, they don't, don't look very good. Like for instance, the blue eyes don't look very good in black and white film, right? And so, so that's really the restriction in terms of anti-miscegenation laws. Uh, on the screen, off screen, the same thing happened, right? We are talking about Anime Wang, one of the most beautiful Chinese women. She actually was not able to get married, as you know. She died in, as, a, uh, as a celibate, right? And uh, the reason was the, is the same, right? Um, um, well, Loving vs. Virginia, right, uh, 1967. Uh, when, when, the, when that, you know, um, uh, Supreme Court eventually uh, struck down, you know, anti-miscegenation, uh, kind of miscegenation, anti-miscegenation, Miscegenation Marriage Act, um, there were still more than a handful, more than a dozen actually U.S. states uh, had the law. And so in her real life, um, she actually learned, uh, she look around, for instance, I, I can give you one example, people orbiting in her universe and another Chinese, famous Chinese who had that problem, although not an actor, uh, we are talking about James Wang Hao, right, the famous cinematographer who won Oscar twice. And uh, when James Wang Hao, who was a very good friend of Anime Wang, um, she, he made a lot of money or had a successful you know, uh, career in Hollywood because he actually figured out how to make, make um, Caucasian actors look good in a black white film. Okay, because he figured out how to use shadow and they make blue eyes look actually charming rather than just pale or lifeless. So at any rate, he made a lot of money. And one year he bought an expensive car, you know, sports car. When he gunned it down to uh, gun it down the Sunset Strip, people would look around and will, will stare and say, wondering which which family will let a Chinese houseboy drive around in such expensive car, right? Mistaking him for because that's kind of racial attitude. But but in his real life, in his life, um, James Wang Hao was in love and later on married uh, his Caucasian wife in France because the marriage was not recognized in the United States. And uh, 
the couple actually hide, had to hide their marriage for many years. Uh, so looking at that kind of you know uh, stories and narratives, uh, people close to her, and she became quite worried because um, despite the, let's say, despite the anti miscegenation laws, uh, if you're working class, people still get married, you know, across uh, racial boundaries. For instance, a lot of Irish women in those years, turn of the century especially, will marry Chinese men and mm. at the risk, actually, of losing their US, U.S. citizenship because it's illegal. If a white woman marries a Chinese man, uh, you could lose your citizenship. Um, but still happened all the time because um, you're working class and Who you're cares? nobody. The government will never, authorities will never come after you. Yeah, who but cares? She, mm-hmm. And Mei Wang, however, was living in the limelight, you know, and she had to be very careful. So so on screen and off screen, this kind of racial attitude and the laws really um, hampered her career and the life as well. I, I did not know that it was a thing for, for Irish women and Chinese men to get married. Oh, yeah. Chinese men are very mar- um, eligible bachelors in those years because there are so many chinese men compared to chinese women yeah and they're all bachelors because chinese women very few chinese women will come once again because of immigration restriction uh you know yeah um how, how did asian americans respond to the roles that anime wong played during this time uh, in those years, she was really the only Chinese face on the screen, right? And uh, so, um, speaking in those years, there was no kind of a, how should I put this? Most Asian American actors were having mo- or mostly at best the bit parts in Hollywood. So if you're talking about Asian American actors, um, they, of course, they're envious, they're supportive anime one. That she was able to, you know, lead the pad, so-called, uh, um, blaze the trail in some ways. Um, but here's the uh, interesting thing. So she went when she went to China, for instance. The reason I said earlier uh, she went to Australia in order to be recognized as Chinese is exactly because of the Chinese reaction to her performance uh, in these films. Right? Uh, Hollywood films or American films in general were quite popular uh, in China as elsewhere in the world in those years. And um, so China will ban some of her films, such as Daughter of Fu Manchu, for instance, or, or Shanghai Express, uh, the, the other very famous film in which Anime Wang you know, co-stars with Marina Dietrich, right? And uh, so when she went to China, she had very kind of uh, ambivalent uh, reception. On the one hand, Many Chinese are proud that they have a Chinese star on the screen, global icon. On the other hand, some people are not happy. We're not happy about some of these stereotypical roles uh, she played. So she had kind of mis- mixed reaction. And this is really in stark contrast, and this is the funny part or, or sad part, the contrast to on- Warner Oland, the Swedish guy who <laughs> came to America at the age of 13 and then eventually became a big star in Hollywood by doing Yellow Face, playing Dr. Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan. So Warner Olin, Anime One's good friend, went to China in the same year. And I already talked about her mixed reaction, you know, reception by Chinese. Interestingly, Warner Olin got a ecstatic and a warm reception. Chinese conveniently, conveniently, I should say, forget, choose, you know, chose to forget that she was, he was also Dr. Fu Manchu. So they welcomed him as Mr. Chang, you know, the, the Chinese son had returned. And so, of course, uh, I mean, I, I, I feel funny to say this, but, uh, you know, uh, sexism is not an American un- monopoly, right? Yeah. And Dr. Fu Manchu, this is sort of get, is central in understanding, am I correct in this, uh, sort of the ye- what was known as the Yellow Peril? Right, it's the yellow peril. So, Dr. Fu Manchu and Charlie Chan are literally like two sides of the same coin, right? It's the oriental imagination what a Chinese, uh, you know, is or, or should be. In some ways, uh, while Fu Manchu is the bad China man and uh, the Charlie Chan is the good one who will help the white society, mainstream society, you know, solve crimes and everything, 
So he has a funny kind of experience. So a few years ago when I wrote this Charlie Chan book, right, you know, it came out and got a lot of attention. And I was trying to find a Chinese publisher for it. And um, one editor, Chinese editor, told me at the time, so, like, oh, it's great, you know, your book is really interesting. But we all prefer to see a Fu Manchu book. <laughs> because <laughs> given the Sino-US tension, as you see, because they think Charlie Chan really is just a servant right, to mainstream American society. Whereas Fu Manchu, as bad ass as he is, <laughs> at least he's powerful, right? a genius, an evil genius. So, you know, that's kind of, so I'm kind of sort of caught in between these two ways of thinking about the world and the tensions. How, how did Anna Mae Wong view the roles that she played, especially the, the stronger stereotypical ones? And and I said in my introduction, and if I was off on this, you'll correct me, that some people see her the way she played them as being subversive in herself in, in, in itself. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, this is really part of my argument that I I, I do think. She was totally aware of this ambivalent ambiguity that, that the sad reality she was, you know, these stereotypes are imposed on her. I mean, imagine if you're in a studio uh, facing a director, if you act in a certain way and they'll say cut, you know, you can't do it like that. Um, just give you one example, a simple example, not just in terms of acting, it just seems like a stage design. So when she was in uh, Shanghai Express, again, starring next to uh, Marina Dietrich, you know, playing second fiddle to this German star, she actually is very good. I would argue she held her ground. She is at least as good as Marina Dietrich, if not even better in some way, in, depending on, you know, what you like. You know, if you like in you know, a film noir kind of gum oil character, I think she's totally far better than Shanghai Lily, uh, played by Marina Dietrich. But just one example, for instance, um, uh, Joseph von Sternberg, the director of the film, um, he designed the train, the Shanghai Express, in a particular way. And she, he even hand-painted the train a certain way in order to fit her his own imagination. So as Chinese, Anime Wang, Anime Wang went over and said, well, this, this doesn't look like a Chinese train. And uh, Sternberg said, well, you know, this is what a Chinese train should look like. <laughs> So we are we are talking about this kind of artistic environment in which <clears throat> stereotype versus subvention kind of up against each other, right? Facing a, a powerful director who can de determine your career and or, or or begin your or career. So so she was really, you know, forced into this very limited space. So so I think her story we need to step back and think, uh, put her narrative in a much larger context and say <clears throat> how this you know daughter of a Chinese laundryman can, can rise to the occasion despite all the restrictions and, uh, and the cards are literally stacked against her in terms of the freedom to perform and you know what choices she could make. Uh, those are very limited choices. So if you look at you know her narrative, her career and from a larger perspective, you understand actually how hard she fought for all this. And that's the reason, for instance, 100 years after a debut in Hollywood, 1919, Red Lantern, right? That's when Anime One debuted as a uncredited, uh, unrecognized, actually, extra in that film. A hundred years later, Lucy Liu, the other Chinese star, you know, Kill Bill, Charlie's Angel and everything. And by the way, Lucy Liu also got the same kind of criticism for playing this stereotypical dragon lady characters. Yeah. When Lucy Liu had her star, installed on Hollywood Walk of Fame, if you look at the clip, you know, the video, she actually thanked Anime Wong uh, for blazing the trail for Asian American actors like her, despite the tremendous obstacles erected by the industry and by the culture in general, that she made it, you know. So she, um, she said, I want to thank Anime Wong, not necessarily my great aunt, but she's definitely one of my, you know, uh, predecessor, braving the storm and everything. So I thought it was a very kind of touchy moment. An Anime Wong would sign off on some of her correspondence with Orientally Yours, right. which was meant tongue in cheek. Oh, absolutely. So, so one of the things you know, I um, or I should say discoveries I made uh, in this book. Um, 
is that I found out, despite the fact, you know, she never really graduated, uh, you know, I mean, she barely graduated from high school, but she was actually a great writer. You know, the, 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 the term you just, um, you know, quote, orientally yours, it's really kind of parodic. She told, it, it really uh, captures her entire kind of mentality and psyche really well. On the one hand, yes, she understood she was looked at as an oriental woman, attractive, but forbidden, in, right? And therefore, she was kind of teasing way, say, orientally yours. Tell me about the film, The Good Earth. This is a film uh -huh. that she does not star in, that she's not in it at all. This, The Good Earth is about Chinese farmers. And right. this is a film she will, very much I wanted to be in. It, uh, I would like to retitle it as Not So Good Earth. <laughs> so The Good Earth was really the... In the 1930s, based on Pearl Buck's, you know, award-winning novel about the rise and fall of a Chinese farmer, Wang Long, and um, made in the middle of the Great Depression and Dust Bowl, the Hollywood studios thought, what Americans will not like a film or cannot relate to a film like that. So it was one of the biggest ever kind of mega China film those years. And anime one, we are, this is the equivalent, say, the Bobby film. You know, everybody will be talking about it, waiting for it to co uh, come out. It took years to make as well. And the studio hired an army of coolie laborers and to call a California hillside and turn it into rice paddy. Took them four years. That's how kind of investment, right, uh, it was. So anime one, having, you know, played so, in so many films, having had pretty successful career and the, the most recognizable Chinese star on the screen, she really won that part, of course, the, as the female lead. And unfortunately, again, we are talking about the 1930s and Chinese were really still regarded as too Chinese to play a Chinese role, right? Including the train, you know, the Wang Sternberg has his own idea and the same thing, what a Chinese should look like uh, according to Hollywood imagination and the same way American imagine, popular imagination, uh, she apparently does not fit. And uh, so when the male lead uh, was decided already, they, they gave it to Paul Mooney, an Hunger, you know, Hungarian um, um, uh, actor, um, Hungarian-Austrian actor, I, I believe. When he was chosen as the male lead, Anime Wang knew that she would never get a part. And uh, so she was really disappointed, certainly. And as you know, um, and it's not just her um, alone, because the film historian, you know, film historians today still talk about the good earth in the sense, uh, what a big insult to the Asian American community it was, because the film ended up casting predominantly, you know, uh, uh, Caucasian roles, leads, right, uh, including Louise Rayner. To her credit, she was actually very good in the sense. She won Oscar for for that role, right? The yellow face role, and most kind of so-called real Asian actors were all put in the background, uh, mostly as ambience. And so, so um, one I, I remember one film critic said, you know, this could have been our Gone with the Wind, but it never happened. And uh, as a result, you know, Anime One was utterly disappointed, and she left for China. Uh, in 1936. Did, did her sister play a small role in this film? Well, that's another tragic aspect of this. Mary, her younger sister, managed to get a very small role as the young bride. And uh, this is really kind of, you know, heartbreaking in a sense. So Mary, uh, her career in Hollywood never took off. After that the small part and again, a depressing, you know, uh, role, and uh, Mary later on killed herself, uh, you know. Um, uh, so that's the, the sad part of uh, not just, you know, anime while not getting uh, the, uh, the lead role, but her sister getting the small part uh, ended, uh, you know, her life ended in tragedy. You've talked about Anna May Wong has to deal with sort of the three obstacles of society, racism, sexism, and then ageism. What, right. what would happen to Anna Mae Wong is, and she didn't live to be very old. She she died herself at the age of 56. Correct. Um, so her career sort of took a downturn 
uh, when she was barely mid thirties. I mean, it's not uh, something extraordinary, uh, you know, uh, exceptional uh, for actors in those years, uh, you know, actresses in those years. Um, and, and my book also draws uh, quite a few parallel examples. But the most, the, the closest parallel on the draw was really Sunset Boulevard, right? Uh, based on sort of like a life of uh, Gloria Swanson, uh, Norman Desmond. So we can picture anime once. Uh, later life uh, in LA, the big nowhere. And uh, the very few, it's like fishing off season, you know, occasionally there were parts that come to her, but those are not really very good parts or, or big parts. And so she was <clears throat> um, really in deep depression and took to the bottle. So she suffered from alcoholism and eventually, you know, and so she went through her, uh, the 1950s, uh, you know, the, the post-war American Kind of affluence and, uh, and stability and all that. There was also the depression as well. So she would have, well, you know, a drink in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and uh, she eventually died of a heart attack uh, at the age of fifty-six at a home in Santa Monica. But the, the important thing to add is that uh, she was always just like Norma uh, Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, and uh, you know, actor actresses who suffer from um, um, ageism, they always dreamed of this big comeback, right? Um, and anyone is the same. She wanted this big comeback and she eventually got it or almost. And she was actually given this role in the Flower Drum Song. And this is a Broadway show, right? Adapted for the screen. And having missed the good earth, uh, the Flower Drum Song would have been her big comeback uh, in the fashion of Norma Desmond. Um, so when she died of heart attack, the film's uh, screenplay was actually lying right next to her. Hmm. And uh, she was diligently working on the screenplay. Where actually, the film would have started you know, a shooting just in a few weeks. And unfortunately, you know, um, so I will call her um, in the honor of her tremendous career, but recognizing all the cultural elements we have discussed, uh, I wanted to call her the star coolie in uh, Hollywood's dream factory. And this is again, it's kind of tongue in cheek, you know, term to, to call her a star coolie, because the irony, the deep irony of her story. T t star coolie, I mean, yeah, meaning star like the coolie, coolie workers. Yeah, coolie worker. Because on the, as you know, she's not just a film star. She's also a fashion icon, right? She had this kind of uncanny ability to turn um, working class aesthetics, such as coolie hat and coolie jacket, into high class fashion. So and that was part of the fashion. Of her, right? That was part of the fashion. That, Absolutely. That's yeah. important. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead with what you were saying. I just wanted to underline yeah. that. No, I'm just saying, you know, they had the coolie hat, and then when she wears these working class, you know, symbols, uh, she kind of uncannily turn them into high class fashion. And, and that takes a lot of, you know, ingenuity and imagination, certainly. Right? But was that part of the flapper look? That's less a flapper look, actually. It's more uh, high class fashion. You know, she introduced, for instance, Qi Pao, the Chinese women's robe called Chong Song. That's another uh, term for it. And uh, it became quite trendy after Anime Wang sported this, you know, Chinese clothing. Yunte Huang has been our guest. Yunte Huang is a Guggenheim Fellow and a professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and the author of the book that he has joined us to talk about. It's called Daughter of the Dragon, Anime Wang's Rendezvous with American History. Yunte Huang, I've enjoyed our conversation very much, and I thank you for taking time to talk to us today. Well, thank you for having me, Mitch.